welcome everyone to the TD Group panel. I am happy to be here as um, your kind of moderator today. We have a, a great uh, set of panelists uh, that have run uh, open source programs in uh, you know a variety of companies. Uh, Nithya Ruff uh, is from Comcast, and Justin uh, is from F Fidelity. Uh, I've been involved with the TD Group for quite a while, uh, and same with these folks. Um, uh, Nithya, uh, do you want to say something a little bit about yourself um, and, and Justin also before we kind of get started with a brief introduction to OSPOs and uh, the questions for the rest of the time? Absolutely. Hey, Chris, thank you. Uh, and it's always good to have Chris as a bonus uh, mystery guest, right, <laughs> on the panel. Um, it's really wonderful because Justin and I are both are uh, in Raleigh. And we are local folks. And uh, so sadly, all of you are not here. Uh, the weather is quite good today. Um, so Nithya Ruff, I run the open source office at Comcast, as Chris indicated. Um, I've been doing open source since 98. And um, I started running open source program offices in SanDisk um, around 2014-15. And then since then, I've been uh, doing uh, OSPOs and it's, it's one of the, the best jobs I've had, I would say. And it's fun to be here, Chris. Awesome, glad to have you. Uh, Justin, you wanna give yourself a little background intro? Yeah, and uh, Justin Ratcliffe. Um, so again, Fidelity Investments. Um, I'm still, I still consider myself new to the OSPO game. Um, very green, still learning a whole lot, um, but, uh, groups like to do and uh, people like Chris and Nithya have been essential to, to Fidelity figuring out um, how to do open source in a way that makes sense to Fidelity. Awesome, fantastic to have you both and getting this panel uh, organized in short time has been a fun experience. Um, yeah, so um, before we kind of get started with questions for our panelists, we'll do kind of a brief introduction of what exactly is an OSPO, since a lot of people sometimes aren't aware of it. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the to-do group, and then we'll hand it off for kind of questions um, that I've prepared uh, today and also potentially from um, the audience before we kind of close uh, things out. So a little bit of uh, background. So, you know, hey, we're on an OSPO panel. What's an OSPO? So as a group, we've come together to help kind of, you know, define our, our field, our practice, you know, essentially, you know, the job that many folks do within the uh, to-do group. So we've essentially come to this definition that an OSPO is basically the center of competency, competency for an organization's open source operations and structure. You know, this can include setting policies around, you know, distribution, auditing, you know, selection of open source, as well as training, you know, developers in the company to ensure that they're compliant with all sorts of open source practices uh, and so on. Um, you know, we found from our experience that, you know, since OSPOs are fairly uh, a new thing, you know, I think, you know, depending on how far you want to go back in time, whether, you know, Sun or IBM, you know, had the first kind of open source program, there really isn't traditionally one way to kind of um, do this, uh, you know, overall, some of these OSPOs tend to live in engineering organizations, maybe an office of the CTO, sometimes in legal departments, if, you know, compliance is the most important thing. So I think the key point that we want to share is, you know, OSPOs are essentially the center of competency for, you know, open source activities in an organization, um, but there are many ways to kind of build them out. If you look at the uh, definition GitHub repo that we put together, uh, it features some great examples across the industry um, that you can kind of um, look at. Uh, the to-do group was formed about a little over five years ago, and it was essentially formed as a reaction for uh, some of us who were running OSPOs at the time, including myself, who uh, was at Twitter at the time, building out their, their open source program. And we were essentially running this problem of we were sharing tools and ideas of like, how do you use GitHub to scale to thousands of engineers? Or how are you, you know, doing, you know, onboarding training and new hire orientation and so on. And so it's eventually what happened, you know, this kind of private mailing list of individuals across companies eventually turned into a formal uh, group that we announced um, at Facebook's uh, conference at the time, a little over uh, five, five, six years ago uh, now. And essentially what it's grown to outside of a initial handful uh, of companies that were generally 
let's say Silicon Valley biased, we've grown to feature companies all over the world from, you know, different industries, verticals uh, to, you know, as far as, you know, different geographies um, out there, you know, recently had uh, Deutsche Bahn uh, join, which is the German central train company. And, you know, they're building out an open source program. So it's kind of always interesting to see uh, different organizations out there building open source programs. And we're even seeing, you know, things outside of typical companies. We're seeing, you know, academia and, you know, governments doing this. So it's super exciting. And we're essentially the group of folks you know that you know band together to help you know build educational materials share best practices and even share you know tools that we develop so it's basically who we are as as an organization a um, couple things that you know to to show before we kind of uh, get into our questions for our esteemed panelists is uh, one of our outputs tends to be an open source survey that we do around ospos every year um, if you go to the github link to do group slash survey on github we share all the data and all that good stuff you go kind of you know get questions answered that you may commonly um you know think about when you uh do open source programs with the organizations from like where does the ospo live how big is it um how is the ospo reacting to the pandemic these days uh, on top of you know where ospos are investing so i think this is one of our you know great outputs and deliverables we do uh every year and if you have any questions or want to modify this it's all open on github available for you to send prs and questions for future future surveys uh and then finally you know uh, one of the probably best outputs we've also done is our guides if you go to tutorgroup.org.guides essentially these are all about like how do you start your own open source program? What tools would you use? Um, how do you unfortunately potentially archive a project if you ever have to do that within your open source organizations and so on. So highly recommend that you take a look at all these wonderful guides. Um, we have a variety of translations out there and um, we always look forward to kind of sharing what we've developed uh, amongst ourselves. So um, that's kind of the rough little history of you know what to do group is, what an OSPO is and so on. Um, really the heart of this discussion today is hearing expert opinions from our panelists and um you know i'd love to kind of kind of dive into that so you know uh first kind of you know set of questions here before we kind of uh, jump in for the audience is we'll kind of go over these but um you know maybe we'll start with um you know nithia here because you know everyone has kind of started their career in ospos differently sometimes you know it's self-selecting an engineer just wants to care about open source sometimes you know someone's roped in it through another way so i kind of would love to hear both justin and nithia's perspective on this i know nithia touched a little bit this about this on your role in sandisk but we'd love to learn uh, a little bit more so how did you get started in uh in open source program management nithia i know um so the way it happened i was in one of the divisions of sandisk and by background, um, I'm a product marketing and product manager uh, type of a person. So I was playing the role of product marketing. And a lot of the work that I was doing to launch this project uh, was open source oriented, was working with legal on licenses and contributions and working with our development team on how they would upstream their patches and things of that nature. Because our product was completely open source based, it was based on Ceph. And as I was doing more of this open source work, it dawned on me that other divisions in the company were also doing a lot of open source work. And there was no one central place for consistently um, documenting and solving you know, some of these challenges that we all faced. So I pitched the idea of starting an open source program office to our senior vice president and our uh, chief strategy officer. And I said, you know, we really need one because we have every division doing its own thing. We have developers kind of willy nilly uh, doing uh, participation contribution and legal is getting inundated with questions. So I think I, I'm happy to be an open source program office for you. And so they said, okay, uh, pitch us what you would do for the first 90 days and how you would make an impact. And I had to write up a list of things I would do as an OSPO. And it was extremely helpful to actually look at the to-do group website and talk to various OSPO people. And, and I was a one woman shop. I, I ran the OSPO <laughs> for Comcast, um, you know, across uh, almost four or 5,000 developers. Um, and it was super fun. Awesome, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a interesting uh, beginning. It's, it's always nice when you can write your own job description. It's always, always the best. Exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. and they just left me alone to do my thing. Awesome, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, and so, 
um, you know, Justin, you know, the, the, the financial, you know, world tends to be a little bit different than, you know, the SanDisk, which is kind of, you know, hardware, traditional, you know, kind of hardware focused company. So I'd learn, love to learn, you know, kind of your story of how, how it started in, in Fidelity and, and financial land in, in general, which tends to have a different view of the world. Yeah, sure. I mean, for, for the longest time, Fidelity uh, approached us with a board because everybody loves a bureaucratic board, architecture review boards put a bunch of senior technologists together to make uh, decisions, potentially arbitrary, uh, based around what the news is of the day. Um, and that board was, was functional um, for a long time. Uh, they established our policy. Uh, we have, we have uh, alumnus of the to-do group uh, that helped to kick it off uh, back in like 2013, 2012. And um, was, there was a thing that happened beginning of 2017 uh, around an Apache project that let's say scared some folks. Um, not to name names, um, but there were it was with people's personal personal identifiable data uh, and relatively financial services related, um, and folks went, uh oh, um, where do we stand on this? And they realized a board, um, kind of like a volunteer firefighter organization, is not the most accountable type of party uh, because hey, they have a they have a day job. Um, this is something they were doing in the backside. So. Um, I had been working with the OpenStack Foundation on some of their, uh, and OpenStack project on the enterprise working group. And um, I was actually on vacation. I got an, an email with my new org chart. Um, I heard somebody decided that I knew what, how to spell GPL and uh, that for, therefore I was qualified to run a program office. Um, so uh, one of the first things I do is I think I sent something to the info at to do group and said, Hey, um, what can I what can I do to to learn real fast? Um, and I ended up showing up uh, as a non-member. Uh, Chris actually allowed me to show up uh, at the Amazon building at Doppler uh, a couple of years back. <laughs> um, and again, it's just been it's been trying to learn a little bit on the fly ever since. Um, but again, we're we're trying to figure it out. Uh, and the good thing is, Fidelity is is willing to kind of invest in that environment and know that it's the right thing to do for the future. Um, mm -hmm. And there's plenty of lessons to be learned. Awesome, yeah, it's, it's interesting how for some people it's usually maybe like a specific pain point, you know, someone uses GPL code accidentally, all of a sudden like someone needs to own this. And, you know, I always see the transition of, I, I definitely see a lot of open source programs starting kind of as like the architecture review board style, or it's like a part-time responsibility for someone until maybe some serious problem hits it like, oh, wait a minute, we need full-time ownership because it's, it's not working. <laughs> so it's awesome. Um, so yeah, so we have, you know, a limited amount of time and some questions to continue to kind of go through. I think both those stories are great. And if, especially if you talk to other people starting open source programs, they could tell you that, you know, it, it's almost always different and usually starts from kind of an initiative or pain point within the organization. So uh, a lot of question I sometimes get fielded is like, so as a, you know, a head of an OSPO, What's kind of your, your you know, your day to day like, you know, you know, are you sitting there reviewing what packages, you know, developers use? Are you coming up with, you know, strategies of, you know, where you should invest resources? So, you know, it'd be good to kind of, you know, understand, you know, you know, how you go about your day or, or, or week and, you know, maybe just like planning um, and, and kind of priorities. And, and, you know, maybe, you know, we could kind of combine this with the next question around kind of like priorities, so on. So like kind of where you're focusing on. Uh, now and maybe how that's kind of um, shifting. So let's see if we may combine those because I think they're kind of related uh, questions. Okay, uh, maybe, you know, Nithya, you wanna go take this one first? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as you pointed out, every organization is different. Everybody's journey to OSPO is different. Uh, but one of the common things you find is OSPO leaders are bridge builders, they're translators, they're connectors, they are in service or they're developer advocates across the organization. And I find that all of my peers in the to-do group are amazing, versatile people who can really kind of go across lots of different topics. The reason I say that is because at any given point, I'll start off the day talking to legal about contributions or some compliance related issue and then may end the day talking to the Linux Foundation or somewhere in the middle, I may talk to a developer or I may talk to our public relations and comms team about a blog we want to post or a PR we want to do. So you're kind of constantly pivoting, I think, 
uh, between different topics because we really serve all of those needs from compliance all the way to communications and a community. So in terms of my priorities, um, especially this year, my priorities have been, uh, I, I, I jokingly say compliance, compliance, compliance. Um, but seriously, compliance and automating our compliance, shifting left compliance so that engineering owns it in the product development process, automating that is one big uh, you know, multi-year priority, if you will. The second one is um, really spreading inner source and collaboration culture inside the organization, breaking down silos, uh, teaching uh, some of the collaborative practices we use in open source inside the company. And the third one is automating and scaling all of our processes because we're a really tiny OSPO and we have thousands of developers and we cannot afford to reach everybody um, unless we you know, automate our open source contribution request process or our compliance process. And so, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're doing. Awesome, fantastic. Automation makes a lot of sense. Justin, what about you? Um, so uh, most of the time, especially lately, uh, I've been waking up to emails and meetings from my audit team. Um, so yay, uh, always a good way to start the morning. Definitely need to go with the uh, espresso on those days. Um, but uh, it, it really varies. Uh, as Nithya kind of called out, it's you're, you're the locust, you're the traffic cop uh, for a lot of things. I think one, one area that I find that fidelity approaches a little bit differently than some is um, I'm part of our procurement uh, process. So as we source services or products, um, I'll be engaged to do an open source review to the best of my ability and whatever they will give me. Um, some organizations, because they, they have a distribution, are more free with their bill of materials. Others are not. Um, but I'll try to convince them and say, hey, we're, we're going to protect this, but you have our data, you have our content, and your practices and processes matter to me. Um, because if you're breached, they aren't going to just blame you. They're going to blame because it's Fidelity's data. They're going to blame us. Um, and really trying to build those relationships and those partnerships, even outside of Fidelity. Um, around uh, open source supply chain practices uh, and integrity there. Um, probably for, for priorities, um, developer experience, I, I still don't think we do the greatest job of it. Uh, we have COBOL developers all the way up to um, leading edge uh, mobile app development. And it all involves open source. Um, but the needs are drastically different. The risk tolerance is drastically different. Um, so looking at processes that make sense, that are rational, and it, at some level can adapt to the individual uh, team needs that al allow them to give them some choice, um, make, smart, make smart choices, experiment, um, have some fun, and, uh, but protect Fidelity's interests. Um, so I think that's probably number one. Um, everybody's automating everything. I count that as developer experience. Um, and uh, I think it, just getting people to, to really not look at software as a zero sum game uh, is an ever present challenge. Um, Matt AC kind of called that out in the keynote um, around saying, no, like we can all create this stuff. We can all contribute to the same thing and it makes actually more. Um, really new concept, especially to folks like the financial services industry, where uh, barriers were high. Um, so essentially keeping those those moats um, deep actually was the competitive advantage. Um, so retraining folks is another big priority. Awesome, fantastic. I could see how there's a little, you know, a little overlap of kind of what both open source programs, you know, do at Com Comcast and Fidelity, but with a little different focus. Uh, areas. So another thing, um, you know, to discuss is, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, OSPOs tend to, you know, be structured differently depending on the type of organization, what they care for. I would love to kind of hear, you know, um, you know, uh, where your OSPO currently lives, uh, you know, how large is the team and kind of roughly what roles they do, because, you know, I've seen teams that have, you know, to 
it's a just one person or it's a it's an army of you know 20 folks so i'd love to kind of hear how things are are structured um within uh within your organization so um at comcast um chris i started off as the only person but um, now over the course of three years, we are about a six people um, office, including myself. And we report into the CTO of Comcast, uh, Cable basically, uh, Comcast has multiple businesses, but Cable is where we live. And then we do help other uh, smaller OSPOs in the Comcast entities like Sky or DreamWorks or NBC. Um, but we predominantly take care of the cable business because most of the engineers are there. And uh, the roles are, um, at least what we've determined is that we needed, you know, a few folks on compliance mm -hmm. um, and a couple of folks on community management, whether it's uh, external and internal community or working with certain key organizations like the CNCF or the Yocto mm -hmm. project, which are be a very uh, aligned with, uh, so they do that. And then we also um, really created a position as an open source developer. Uh, so we have a principal engineer who helps us do a lot of the automation, a lot of the uh, engineering work, if you will, behind the OSPO and metrics and you know, uh, making sure that some of the infrastructure that we have runs. Um, so, so that's, that's what we've set it up as. Okay. Very cool. It's interesting that there's like a network of OSPOs across the different, uh, I guess, umbrella companies since Comcast is a massive, uh, or organization. So cool mix of program management and engineering. Uh, Justin, how about, how about you? What's how's, how are things over there? I am the OSPO. No, <laughs> like the just red <laughs> quote in your head. Uh, Love it. so team of, team of one. Um, especially with, with, I would say a mature company, uh, bureaucracy is always a risk. Like all of a sudden people want to start building armies, um, and, and developers don't tend to take that well. Um, so in some ways it's, it, it helps me make sure that what I'm doing is scalable and, and makes sense to the, all the community at large. So I have to have those relationships. Um, I have to build confidence and credibility with our legal team, compliance, audit, fill in the blank um and be able to prioritize um we aren't let's say the most public company out there uh, in more ways than one um which again helps me scale where where i'm at today um but when we actually quote unquote if, if i hit a blocker if throughput starts to kind of choke off things that's when we solve that problem what we won't do is is build up the army to to magically solve the problem that doesn't exist yet um, so we may not ever get there. So, um, I'm currently head, uh, kind of aligned with our cloud organization. Um, and that's more of a historical thing than anything else. Um, but again, cloud and open source, uh, it's peanut butter and chocolate. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of value in, in, in alignment in being able to say, okay, cool. This is where we're going. This is what we're using, um, mm -hmm. and, and making a difference there. Awesome. And so maybe like a related question would be like, what would be your ideal size? So, so like if you, if you could have another head count, what would you like focus on or what are you do? And both maybe Nithya and Justin could uh, a answer this. Cause I think the ideal size of an OSPO is going to be different for the organization, uh, obviously. I, I think Justin brought up a really good point. <laughs> I mean, all of us are very dependent upon uh, part-time legal help, part-time comms help, you know, lots of groups help us. Um, so we don't do uh, everything ourselves. So mm -hmm. if I had um, more headcount, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say I need more developers in my team mm -hmm. because I, we want to do more upstream contribution on the OSPO infrastructure and tooling side. And mm -hmm. we also want to automate more. And we really struggle with one principal engineer He's absolutely fantastic, but um, we don't have redundancy, you know, in case something happens, uh, we, we don't have a backup for him. And we also need mm -hmm. to, we operate, for example, the compliance tools ourselves, mm -hmm. and we do a ticketing system for compliance and other things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really would, could use another developer or two. Yeah, I didn't mean to put everyone on the spot there, but I think it's an interesting uh, question. I'll, I'll help justify more headcount for you. That would be great. 
And for me, yes, it, it probably would be the, the social media side. I mean, external okay. comms, PR. it's yeah. it's hard in a regulated industry. Um, there's a <laughs> lot of pre-review, there's a lot of gates you gotta hit. Um, okay. and it takes a lot of time, uh, but it's something that you have to do. Um, but a lot of times it falls down my priority stack because um, it just has some limited bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, so figuring out a way to find somebody um, to dedicate to, to okay. kind of raising our brand there in a way that our, our compliance and auditors will be okay with. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely have a lot of challenges there from a regulation point, point of view that I'm uh, not, not envious of by any means. Um, so, you know, I, I want to definitely be sensitive of, of time and leave some time for the audience to ask questions. I'll ask a couple more, you know, obviously we're kind of in this uh, you know, wild, uh, you know, times in 2020 with the pandemic uh, affecting, you know, many people's, you know, livelihoods and, you know, we're all, you know, remote uh, now. How, how has kind of this um, affected, um, you know, your team and an environment? Has it basically caused an acceleration in investment? Is there more of a, you know, are they using, you know, open source has almost been inherently distributed from from day one, right? And so we have a lot of lessons when it comes to collaboration remote. So I'd love, kinda, love to learn what the, the impact um, you know, kind of has been in this, in this, in the age of pandemic and COVID, COVID-19? You know, I, um, most of my team are distributed, some in Philadelphia and, and kind of all over the place. And I used to really rely on physical presence. I would go to Philly once a month to spend time with my team. So that changed dramatically. And, um, I, I have to say it's been a fantastic year from the perspective that we've really bonded as a team and we've spent a lot more team uh, time together. Uh, so one of the first priorities for us was making sure our teams were safe, that they weren't stressed and that they had all the tools and you know techniques necessary to work virtually. Because I worked virtually, but a lot of my team uh, we're used to going to Comcast Technology Center and working from there. Um, so that was important. And then making, you know, no meeting days and encouraging people to take time off because you, you kind of think I, I'm always at home, so I'm not going to take time off uh, because I'm not going anywhere. But people really, really need to de-stress during this time. So we've tried to do that. Um, We've had a lot of people attending virtual events uh, from all of our developer base because A, it's less expensive. It's easy to hop on to a Zoom or, um, so we've had record attendance at Open Source Summit and KubeCon and All Things Open and you know all of these uh, inner source summit and so on and so forth. So I would say uh, those have been some of the changes. I don't think we've scaled back the organization, but we are, being very, very careful um, about the budget because uh, it's been a crazy year financially for some parts of the business, but not for the other parts of the business. Got it. J Justin, you have anything to share on, on, on this? I mean, I think it's, a, it's similar. Um, luckily, I don't have to travel for teams, uh, but Fidelity gets a lot of stuff done via human to human high bandwidth conversations. And you can replace that with Zoom meetings. Um, so helping people kind of adapt to an asynchronous work style being, you need to solve this and it needs to be time zone independent. Um, and it needs to have a record keeping system. Doesn't that sound like source code? Doesn't it sound like issue management? Like, um, trying to, to kind of break people of bad habits and crutches, um, it's been, again, a challenge. I won't say I've made the, the hugest amount of pro uh, pro uh, progress there, um, but it's something that I think is uniquely positioned for an OSPO to kind of lead in an organization is saying, as an open source project and experience in open source projects, you know how to lead things globally, irrespective mm -hmm. of time, you know how to deal with priorities. Um, so being able to translate that into an internal process highly valuable. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I've definitely heard um, a lot of folks that, you know, traditionally would have travel budget set aside, and that's kind of been converted to training or L&D related activities. So it's kind of interesting to, to, to hear that that's kind of what's happening, at least on, on the Comcast side. But um, yeah, no, it, it's it's a very interesting uh, state of the world these, these days. So I'll ask one more question before hitting the audience, since we have a little 
around 15, uh, I think 10 to 15 minutes left. So, you know, 2020 has been a wild year, uh, you know, there's tons of things, you know, have been going on in terms of like the OSPO, what's kind of maybe like your favorite thing you, you know, done or shipped this year that you kind of, kind of uh, reflect on or, or about to ship and kind of would love to, uh, you know, to, to learn kind of maybe what you're excited about. So any, Justin or Nithya, anything to, to share in this, uh, in this crowd, maybe open source a cool new project uh, that I should know about. That would be great, especially if it's cloud native related. But. <laughs> I think we have two really cool cloud native projects that I'm very, very proud of. Uh, Trickster, which works on the Prometheus uh, dashboard and accelerates it. And then Kuber Healthy, uh, which is a Kubernetes cluster management system. And what surprised us is um, how many people are using it externally. You know, that's the dream, right? When you open source something that it's actually useful for people and people are actually using it. And we had this fantastic blog from Adobe uh, about Kuba Healthy saying how much they loved it and how much they used it. And that was really gratifying to see, I must, I must admit. And then the second positive thing I would say is my team has been so resilient and, and they've been just so incredibly positive and productive and collaborative. And that makes me really happy, especially because this year has been dreadfully stressful, <laughs> as you said, and, yeah. and just one thing after the other, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as a company and as a team, we've really embraced the year and we've spent a lot of time thinking about diversity and inclusion. We've spent mm -hmm. a lot of time thinking about our country and um, mm -hmm. you know, our company and how do we mm -hmm. you know, be better at uh, being human beings. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'm very proud of that. Awesome. Justin, anything on, on your end? Um, I mean, I get excited about anything that moves out um, <laughs> and, and then willing to do it. But um, I think we have, we have a couple teams that are, are trying to do some of the work that uh, we've been doing a multi-tenancy in Kubernetes and kind of the, mm -hmm. the bootstrapping of clusters um, mm -hmm. and do that purely as an open source effort. So not start it and, and make it, let's say, overly opinionated, but start as it, almost from, from uh, no code all the way up to something actionable um, as an open source work uh, and starting to take in feedback, especially around something that some people look at as an anti-pattern and really wrestling with some of those, those problems because that's new to us. Um, and so that's exciting to me. Uh, we're also doing a lot on the accessibility of AI and ML, um, even just simple stuff, common algorithms, uh, wrapping of stuff like PyTorch and TensorFlow mm -hmm. uh, into more abstractions. So hopefully make it a little easier to get into. Um, I think those are things that we do, we have to do for a lot of our teams, but we can make those things uh, available to others and, and hopefully it makes other people uh, more successful. Awesome. Yeah, I know. Every time you could upstream something and work in the open, I think it's always um, uh, a win. And I think back to like Nithya's point, I was trying to think of like, you know, for myself, you know, I think this year, you know, it's been such a crazy year and just like keeping your team together, you know, people, you know, employed, working, you know, well, and, and you know, kind of surviving these times is, is probably, you know, something that I think we, you know, everyone should be, you know, proud of if, if they've been fortunate to be able to do so, because it's just been a, 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 a wild year for, for folks. Um, so yeah, we have about 10 minutes left and I'll skip over some of the questions, you know, we had here and then I think uh, with, this is Zoom webinar. So I think there's Q and A. So we would love to kind of have some uh, questions from the audience here before. Yeah, there are three uh, questions in the Q and yeah, A. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm trying to find, here you go. Sorry you about that. Handle? Yeah, no, I'm trying to see why it's not showing up. Uh, let's go see um, I, I, I'm Okay, happy cool. To, yeah. Yeah, go for it. It's, uh, let me, maybe I have to Sorry. minimize. Maybe I stopped sharing my screen and that will work. Oh, here you go. Okay, I have to stop sharing my screen. Now it's working. Uh, da, 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 da. So, all right, let's go start with, um, okay, let's go start with, I'll go bottom, bottom ups. So, um, is the, uh, so uh, from uh, Jean-Georges Perrin, is the OSPO more like a grassroot push as in something, I guess that's organized uh, organically, or is it something like a top down executive, uh, you know, decision? Um, anyone want to take, uh, take that one? Probably you know, it's, it's worked both ways for me. In, in the case of SanDisk, it was a grassroots push where 
I was asking for the company to set it up. In the case of Comcast, it was a tops down where the legal team and the executive team said, hey, we need an open source program office in the company to coordinate everything. So I think it can be either way. And we've seen many examples, Chris, of both ways. Yeah, I think I agree. It needs to be both because um, if it comes only as, as a top-down effort, uh, it becomes command and control and, and often the experience of interacting with that office may be not great. Um, if it's only bottom-up, then there may not be the executive buy-in, which if you're running your legal team at a couple hundred dollars an hour, um, that may not, that may not uh, be tolerated for long. Um, so, but... I would start with, with your developer, anybody who's focused or, or passionate about developer experience, because they're gonna be that kind of middle, middle party. Um, someone who's there to, to try to help um, developers be more productive, but also responsible for potentially some of the controls or processes, and they can help advocate uh, up the chain to say, hey, this is why software composition analysis tooling is important. Cool. Yeah. No, I, it's like, like it's, I think it's a mix of how, com, you know, it's structured in the company. I think long-term successfully, most open source programs that, you know, had that mix of kind of ground, you know, support with the executive top-down funding and budget. Cause you know, just like any organization that owns a PNL, you always have to kind of, you know, defend, find your existence, which KPIs and OKRs you work for. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Jean George, we have a couple more. Um, we'll go next one. Uh, if you could go back in time, knowing what you know now and giving yourself advice before either starting an open source program uh, or joining uh, an existing one, what would it be? Uh, who wants to go uh, with this one? I, I have a couple, uh, <laughs> a couple ideas. Gosh. Anyone want to go? If, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say for me, it's, we, we have a, a group that's around our tools, um, our application lifecycle management team. Um, and I didn't have as, as tight a connection to them, their product manager and their the kind of visionary and leadership, um, which has always been kind of an awkward thing because if we're going to do scanning, if we're going to do integration with tools, I kind of need them. Um, so if I could go quote unquote, rewind time, it would be like, no, set up shop um, in, their, in their space, try to make them more successful and help them understand why um, this particular domain can really help them be more successful with their careers. Cool. Um, Anything to add there, Nithya? Just, just that, you know, it's, it's super, super important to have executive sponsorship support uh, in your organization for your OSPO. You cannot really exist without that because you're, most of the time you're a cost center and you need that support. Uh, and I would say also make sure to have metrics, which is the next question, and demonstrate the value that you bring to the company and tie it to the business of the company, right? Each business is different, tie it to the business of the company. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I, I think, you know, reflecting on, on my own time, you know, given that I ran an OSPO a long time ago, A, uh, being under, basically managing up is kind of one way to summarize this is like understand that, you know, here are metrics that you want to hold yourself accountable that align with some, you know, business needs, and then make that well known to your leadership. And, you know, whether it's like a monthly or quarterly all hands, basically build a brand of what your open source program is internally through either internal summits, some type of public internal blog, make sure that you maintain that relationship well, so people understand what you're working on. And then the other thing is, really understanding the, the line of like build versus buy when it comes to developing tooling. Uh, you, know, you know, 10 years or so ago when I was, you know, working, you know, in OSPO land or, you know, however long it was ago, the state of tools was pretty bad. Things have drastically improved in the last few years. So understanding the landscape of which tools out there that you could buy for, you know, source code, you know, analysis or, you know, uh, scanning, you know, security scanning, things have improved drastically, I think, for developers. So understanding that. Um, Ooh, lots of questions coming on. Uh, KPIs for execs. Uh, do you have a good list of KPIs for execs? Generally, I say yes. This is, this is like something you should mandatory do. But Nithya or Justin, do you maintain kind of a list of OKRs or KPRs? I, I think there was another question from Holger Streidel, um, which is also anonymous attendee. Oh, He's sure. been waiting for a, quite some time on that answer. Yeah. So, it, which is actually the same as the next one. 
Um, sure. I, as we all said, it's super, super important to communicate the value of your um, OSPO. I would say we measure things like how many external contributions did we make, to which projects did we make, you know, who are the top contributors from the company. And then we also look at the health of our projects that we've open sourced. Uh, are they trending correctly? You know, are people getting involved? Are we, is the cadence of those projects good? We look at the health of the incoming projects as well. And then, you know, it's really, really difficult to kind of tie what we do to how it made a difference to the bottom line or the top line. Um, so it's, it's, it's a hard one, but I'm trying to measure uh, how much money did we save the company if we say chose open source instead of a commercial product, right? Um, and uh, how do we uh, make developers happier? So through ENPS and you know, things of that sort. So I would say OSPO effectiveness, are we making an impact in the community? And then are we saving the company money, et cetera? Awesome. Anything to add there, Justin? Uh, two easy ads. Um, one is doing stuff like this. Are you talking at events? Being kind of out there and talking about the community, talking about the awesome that York is doing. Um, so there's, there's a space for that. Uh, and then uh, working groups, SIGs. And a lot of the foundations or the larger projects have these little ecosystems in there. And so you can start giving um, some currency to uh, being a SIG lead or uh, working within there in a formal basis, and then actually have time dedicated to it. Uh, so you kind of build into reward mechanisms uh, that helps with open source sustainability, but also helps with your corporate brand and personal brand. Awesome. Well, given that we have a few minutes, we have two more questions uh, from Deborah for training. Do you hire external trainers or all, or all of it is in-house for your kind of open source uh, training? Go ahead, Nithya. Um, mostly in-house, but you know, there are so many fantastic events uh, and uh, organizations that we all attend, uh, to-do group and open source summit and, and uh, all things open, et cetera. So we benefit a lot from attending these events and both the hallway track as well as attending presentations. And then we do some training in-house I know com organizations like um, Brandeis and RIT, et cetera, are trying to start more training programs um, that are cross-functional, legal, and you know, community and things of that nature. So we haven't started partaking of that training yet. Um, we, we basically either create it in-house or we get it from an event. Yeah, I would say like neutral, neutral information. You can go to places, you can go to Linux Foundation. Hey, Chris. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there's a lot of those kind of both, I would say almost boilerplate things, but at some point you're going to run into your kind of organizational priorities that need to be part of your training regimen. So I kind of think of it as like the 80, 20, like um, use uh, neutral, neutral places, uh, plural site, Udemy, phone the blank, um, any of those systems um, that have, uh, certified training, kind of a common training, because that builds kind of a commonality uh, as you're bringing in associates and as your associates are going to other opportunities. But also you, you'll need to have that, that veneer on top that says how to basically map those neutral statements to things that are organizational priorities. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, in the interest of time, um, you know, let's wrap things up. It's been, uh, you know, great to, to host everyone uh, today and hopefully the audience has learned something new. If there's anything that you want to continue discussing around OSPOs, please join us on the To Do Group Slack. If you go to slack.todogroup.org, you could find all of us there and we're happy to answer uh, the questions that we couldn't get through today. So I just wanted to thank Nithya and Justin for their time uh, today, and hopefully everyone is staying healthy and sane out there. And I can't wait till we we'll can't wait till we we'll all see each other all together in person. Uh, hopefully next year. So thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Justin. Bye. Cool. And Bye. thank you all. Things open for hosting. It's been fantastic. <laughs>